As I began to add more and more categories to Citavi, I realized the hierarchies I had inherited from the citation tree and the various folders and subfolders on my hard drive were not the most effective way to thematize. Obviously, I needed to maintain some way of sorting works by the names of their creator, but wanted a way to distinguish authors of written works from other kinds of artists and creators I might be citing, and the various media these creators might use, sometimes interchangeably. Since my references were primarily textual, I also wanted to be able to tag what kind of text I was dealing with in a general way, as well as the historical period with which it was associated, which is not always strictly chronological. I also wanted to at least hold on to generic distinctions that were implicit in the form of the work itself, as well as the various methods that might be put to use in theory or criticism. This left several miscellaneous subjects that did not really seem to fit into either of the major categories. I also needed categories for the kinds of writing and teaching I had to do for work, like the essay category I was just working with before. Eventually, I determined that texts sorted by the name of their author or creator were important enough to warrant their own branch, as were the projects I might need to modify in ways that conflicted with the other branches. This left me with a variety of categories that were inherently thematic, but occasionally superfluous. I didn't really need a separate category for texts if it applied to almost everything in my knowledge base, and was implicit in the reference type itself. I also didn't need to distinguish fine art as a medium from visual studies as a method, since I almost always use them together. With only two subcategories, medium ceased to be a useful category, so I removed it and relocated film, TV, and music to the miscellaneous subjects. But then, when I realized that these subjects might apply directly to works themselves or indirectly to criticism about such subjects, I decided to include the period subcategories as well together with most of the method subcategories. I also replaced the rather redundant genre category with the subcategory literature, since poetry, narrative, and theater are more specific to literature. Then I moved all the subcategories out from under kind, except for theory, which I applied to the three specific methodologies I hadn't yet reassigned. Uncoincidentally, these were some of the most common reference tags at the time. This left me with a much more efficient branch of themes that only divided off into specific subcategories for theory and literature, where I had the most references and the most need for differentiation. I found that the most effective category systems tend to treat information as a cascade. Only when the initial categories are filled to the point of overflow do subcategories become necessary. My current category scheme is built around this idea and is the result of a continuous thematic experimentation. The branches are designed to accommodate the flow of information in such a way that the task of thematization gets relayed from entire references to specific citations, across branches and between categories and subcategories. References can be assigned to almost all of the branches except the most micro-thematic sub-themes within the work itself. This is the point at which references become too general, and specific citations are needed to carry on the work. Citations also cascade down the author and project branches, but do not appear on the theme branch because its themes are only useful on the macro-thematic level of references. The idea is that every new reference receives at least one macro-thematic category off the bat. Then when it gets read, the reference itself and its citations get entered into the categories on the author branch. And finally, if these get incorporated into a class or essay, they appear on the project branch. My current knowledge base has over 2,000 references that can be instantly sorted in a variety of ways, including chronologically, by their original publication date, as I described earlier. You can quickly mark any reference with red flags or blue circles so that it appears prominently while scrolling. You can also filter these markers and many other metadata fields by clicking the icon in the upper right. The categorical branches are ordered in such a way as to maximize the efficiency of the autocomplete search. If I were to look up deconstruction in the category list, for instance, you'll see that the results appear in the order in which the branches are listed. Placing the author branch on top of the projects would require me to scroll past all the work-specific themes that I search less frequently in order to reach the more general theme and project that I use more often. The most popular by far is criticism, since I use this to mark works that focus primarily on other works. It also allows me to separate out primary and secondary works from within other categories, as I will show in just a bit. There are theoretical works broken down into the three most popular subtypes.
and a general philosophy category for all the canonical treatises on metaphysics and ontology from Plato to Heidegger, which is useful for teaching even if there is no hard line between criticism and theory. Then we have literature and its forms and subgenre, film and TV, the digital humanities, dealing with the relationship between technology and the humanities, which you can instantly see by the number of references, has been one of my major interests of late, as has transhumanism, which I take as the study of the ways in which technology changes the relationship between humanity and nature. Then we have the general historical themes from Greek and Roman antiquity to the modern or postmodern era, along with politics, economics, scripture and theology, theories of consciousness and mind, cultural studies, theories of perception and phenomenology, visual studies, music, and finally categories for anthologies, series, and miscellaneous works. There's the project branch, where I have all the references I've been using for the dissertation project, of which this is a part. A separate category for the transhumanism class I've been teaching, broken down into the various lectures, which is more specific than the transhumanism theme above, since it only includes the assigned texts. A class on literature that I've subcategorized by the key quotations for each essay assignment. Another class on the Western genre that I've sorted into the various conventions of this genre. A recent presentation, a digital humanities reading group, a list of texts that still needs to be entered into the citation tree, and a personal reading list. Then there is the text by author branch, where you can see all of the texts that are either written by or about a particular author, listed by the name with more specific subcategories for individual works that have been tagged in more detail, as I will show shortly. Here you can see the value of the criticism category that might at first have seemed too general. Clicking the button in the upper right lets me quickly apply another search criteria to the category I currently have selected. Choosing criticism, I can see that 17 of the 25 works in this demand category are critical works about him. If I want to see only primary sources, I can just open up the search criteria in the upper left and click the arrow by criticism to invert the selection, so that now I am excluding the criticism category within Daman, rather than applying it. Criticism also functions the same way for all the other categories. There's an incredible amount of flexibility when it comes to how you use these kinds of metadata. I've chosen not to use keywords at all for references, since I want to save them exclusively for quotations, but if I decided that I wanted to convert the criticism category to a keyword, I could do this by selecting all the references in the criticism category, batch applying a new criticism keyword, and then right-clicking the current selection and choosing Remove Category Criticism. I can also merge categories if I want to. Say I no longer want to have separate branches for transhumanism as a theme and transhumanism as a class. I could just select one, choose the other category I want to merge, and which category I would like to preserve or delete, and then combine them. Switching to the Knowledge Organizer tab, you can start to see the informational cascade I described earlier. As with the references, I can search, sort, or filter the full list of all 3,000 or so citations, or quickly see which citations still need to be tagged. I don't apply any specific citations to the General Themes branch, but I do apply them to the Project branch. With citations, though, I make more use of the subcategories, putting individual quotations into the chapters I plan to use them in or sorting the various quotations for each class into the works from which they were taken. Here you can see how I was able to juxtapose quotations from novels and scripts with screenshots taken from films in the Western genre class. Again, on the author branch, you can see how the metadata gets relayed from the macro-thematic level of references down to the various micro-thematic subcategories within the work, which I use to sort the citations. But no matter how exact the citations become, they are always one click away from the context of the page. Switching now to keywords, we have an alphabetical list of the hundreds I eventually created over the course of a year using Citavi to tag citations. I give a general overview of this lexicon in another video, but here I'd like to focus on how they function within the knowledge base. As with categories, clicking on any keyword shows you all the quotations to which it has been applied. You can also apply any number of metadata on top of this to narrow the selection. At first, your keywords might just be single words or phrases like hashtags, but as your lexicon grows, you'll likely notice affinities between certain tags that are almost always used together, and you may want to cluster them accordingly. Citations of authors can be tagged more precisely here than we could in references, because the criticism category functions on the macro-thematic level, 
Here we have tags for each individual citation referencing authors like Heidegger or Kafka. While this keyword list lacks the levels of distinction we saw in the category hierarchy, this does not mean that all keywords necessarily function in exactly the same way. I have here, for instance, a tag for tropes and figures of speech that I use rather generally. But I also have a tag for the kinds of tropes that are distinctively excessive and seem to cancel out their initial rhetorical effect. The kind of tropes that are of particular interest to thinkers like Paul Deman and Jacques Derrida. I made sure that these two tags had the same first four letters so that they would show up next to each other in the autocomplete menu so that every time I tagged a trope, I would also be prompted to consider its level of excess. Even though there is no hierarchical relation between these two keyword clusters, you can see that every excessive trope also has the basic trope keyword tag. So you can see that it is possible at least to create levels of emphasis using keywords that have personal organizational value. Even if theoretically speaking, every trope is excessive, I can at least flag the ones that are worth writing about for me. One of the most interesting challenges of building a keyword lexicon from scratch is maintaining its efficacy as more and more references are added to the knowledge base. If you're working on radically different projects, one in the hard sciences and another in the humanities, then it probably makes more sense to have separate lexicons for each. But if you're trying to incorporate literature and theory into the same lexicon, the conceptual overlap might prove productive. If you notice that you use two or more keywords together in almost all cases, you might consider merging them so that you don't need to enter them individually every time. Obviously, it makes sense to group synonymous phrases to avoid redundancy. This is one way to link concepts across contexts or disciplines, which might have different technical terms for a similar idea. For me, this eventually results in something like a conceptual spectrum, where the most generally applicable term or phrase is placed first so that it triggers the autocomplete in Satavi. The more specific terms and jargon then follow after. You may also want to group concepts that aren't exactly synonymous, but are closely related through the same critical vocabulary, as well as abstract ideas and the actions and things that constitute them. You can always make these clusters more or less inclusive based on your level of interest or knowledge of a topic. I've even found it useful in some cases to group keywords that are conceptually opposed. Merging keywords for an entire project is easy to do on the fly, but you want to be careful that your keywords do not become so universal that you use them for every quotation you come across. It's generally best, however, to let keywords that seem redundant pass several times before merging them, in order to ensure that there is no strategic value in leaving them separate. Here I notice that I have a tag for eyes, but I also know that I have another keyword related to vision that I use more often. So I'll do a search and find the more popular keyword and see how the two overlap. A little more than half the time. So I might want to invert the selection and see where I didn't apply the visibility cluster. Here's a quotation from John Barth. I don't see any reason why I wouldn't add the other cluster, so I'll go ahead and do that here. One thing to remember is that the smaller autocomplete fields will only search the first few letters, so they won't pick up clustered words that are not positioned first. This is why it's always best to cluster the more common and logical word first. But if you can't remember the first few letters of the cluster, you can always open up the keyword window and search for any of the words. Now I'll merge the two keywords, which I can do in the main keyword side pane or in this pop-out window. I can then add the merged keyword to the cluster. Splitting keyword clusters is not as easy, but doable, especially if there aren't too many citations to work through. All you have to do is create a new keyword and add it to all of the relevant citations listed under the old keyword, and then remove the old keyword from whichever citations no longer apply. In addition to the search bars in the Knowledge and Reference pane, there's also an advanced search in the top toolbar. This allows you to create complex criteria out of any of the metadata available in Citavi. You can also save any of these searches so that you can quickly apply them as filters and modify them however you like. I've found this quite useful for managing the themes branch, since I can create a search that searches for all of the references that have not yet received a thematic category. If I want to view some or all of these references in the main project window, I just select them and then choose Apply Search results as selection. I have a custom search that shows all of the references with any form of task assigned, which I've created using the asterisk character to select any content for the task field. I can invert this to check if there are any references that haven't yet been assigned a task. Having tasks assigned to every reference can be overwhelming in a project of this size, especially if you assign due dates to a majority of them. 
I much prefer to use the task priority settings than assign due dates simply because you don't need to constantly update priority if you happen not to finish in time. Here you can see that only a handful of the borrow and buy tasks have been marked important. None of the examine and assess tasks are important because this is simply the default task I assign to references I don't have any immediate plan to read, because often I haven't thoroughly checked the quality of the PDF attachment and want to remember to do so before I begin reading. Excerpting quotations and reading, however, are some of the most important tasks, and you can see how many more of them have been marked with the high and low priority. Unlike verifying bibliographic information, which I assign to references with poor quality PDFs. When you first start building your knowledge base, it's tempting to assign high priority liberally. But it's really best to structure your priority system so that there are the most low priority tasks and the fewest high priority tasks. With the advanced search and batch processing functionality of Citavi, you can easily demote all of the medium priority tasks to low priority, and then reevaluate from there. In my current project, I've created special searches for the medium and high priority tasks like reading and excerpting citations, so that I can instantly see what really needs to be done, even amidst thousands of texts and tasks.